So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Clark, for that kind introduction. It is a real honor for me to join you all today, and I was sharing with Dr. Clark how an attorney got into this space. Uh, it's actually interesting. I set out really wanting to go into healthcare administration, was going to do an MPH or an MBA, and um, during one of my internships, I was in South Florida at a hospital in Fort Lauderdale. I was in the emergency department, and I witnessed something that was really life-changing for me. It was a woman. Um, she was from Haiti. She did not speak English, and um, she was just in tremendous pain and agony. You could see it on her face. Uh, she was getting anxious. She couldn't communicate with the triage nurse. And the triage nurse, interestingly enough, called for another nurse. This other nurse was also black, and this nurse was from another island in the Caribbean. Well, the triage nurse thought that because this woman had an accent, well, she obviously is from the same place that this patient's from, and so they tried to put them together to communicate. Um, it actually blew up <laughs> with the nurse now getting upset. Why did you bring me here? I don't speak French Creole. I speak English. I might have an accent. Um, and I said to myself, my God, I wonder how many times this happens in hospitals throughout our country. Because we all know that every second is extremely precious when you're taking care of patients. So that for me was the catalyst that said, wait a second, I'm wondering what I can do to effect some changes. Not only here in the hospital in terms of policy, but at a, on a larger level, at, you know, at a wider level in terms of uh, nationally. And so that got me uh, thinking, gee, I think health law is the route to go. And I'm curious, anybody interested in maybe going to law school? Any health lawyers, future health lawyers, at least one? Okay. Any MPHs, public health folks? Okay. And then how about physicians, M MDs? Okay, great. Well, we need everyone. And I, I am definitely a proponent for transdisciplinary collabor collaboration, and I think this is um, exciting. And I commend the NIH uh, Academy for giving this attention, this issue, the attention that it deserves, because it really is a key component of the transforming journey of health reform that we're embar embarking on. So today, what I want to do is discuss the progress that has been made to advance health equity via laws and policies. And we're going to look over the last 32, 33 years. Then we're going to discuss provisions of the health reform law that will have the greatest impact on vulnerable populations, discuss some of the challenges that we've um, uh, been witnessing or observing in, in terms of trying to advance this health equity agenda, and then discuss opportunities for all of you moving forward. So what's the impact of disparities? This is what we needed to convey to lawmakers when they were putting together the health reform law. So as folks, if you might, re, you might recall during the negotiations, what the various committees did was to actually hold, convene subcommittees or working groups. And no one wanted to look at this issue of health disparities. But we said, wait a second, you know, if the Obama administration is going to call this comprehensive health reform, if the health reformers or uh, the proponents of health reform in the Senate and House are going to call this comprehensive health reform, well, comprehensive should include a health equity agenda. And here is why. So we had to make the case there are 83,000 racial and ethnic minorities that die per year. When you talk about other groups, the disability groups, the LGBT groups, others, et cetera, that number, I'm sure, is way larger. In terms of the costs, what we were having a difficult time trying to convey uh, in terms of making the case was the cost, the economic burden that health disparities has in our nation. Well, at that point, during the negotiations in the fall of 2009, we got the Joint Center for Economic and Political Studies and the Urban Institute to do two studies. And what they found was astonishing. I think the numbers were a lot more frightening than we had imagined. They actually um, figured out that we are spending $300 billion a year in both direct and indirect um, costs. So that was the aha moment we needed. That was the statistic that we needed to convey lawmakers to continue with the agenda. So first, the moral argument was working for us to an extent. Several months after, in the fall of uh, in September 2009, nobody wanted to hear that folks are dying because of disparities. And so we got these figures uh, from several healthcare economists at Johns Hopkins, and we were able to continue pushing this agenda forward. Again, we also made the case that you know, health disparities are not isolated issues. They're really the result of interactive um, factors, environmental, social, et cetera. And what we wanted to keep pressing 
on lawmakers was the fact that negative health outcomes and disparate treatment in healthcare impact the economic and social vitality of communities because if people are sick or they're dying younger, they're not able to contribute. So what did we do to continue pushing this agenda? The World Health Organization in 1985 actually said that health equity implies that ideally everyone should have a fair opportunity to attain their full health potential. 23 years later, and it was interesting, right before we started negotiations over the health reform law, they came out with another study from their Social Determinants of Health um, Committee. And in there, they talked about how health inequities are really intensified by political, economic, or social influences. And it's something that we as a group, the 300 organizations that you heard about earlier, really believed that oftentimes what we've observed is policy, public policy and laws have been a driving force for many of the inequities that we observe in communities across our nation. But we also believe that public policy can be that driving force for helping us appropriately address these issues. And so with that in mind, we really pushed this agenda with both Republican and Democratic lawmakers. And over the last 32 years, this issue, it's a nonpartisan issue, really having tremendous bipartisan support, and you're going to see as we go through the timeline here. But in 1983, many of you might recall that the Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, Margaret Heckler, uh, in 1983 realized that while the overall health of the nation had been improving, the health of racial and ethnic minorities actually was alarming. The statistics were extremely alarming to her. And right when she figured that out, there were several health equity champions that said, you know what, we've got to push her. We have a sensitive person, a person who's sensitive to this issue. We need to come up with a report that spells this out for her. And so some external champions for health equity created a report or uh, actually um, funded a report, gave her the results from that report, and that's what she used then to set things in motion. She then organized her own task force internally at HHS to study this issue. And she got some of the best and brightest minds to come together around this. Well, out of that task force was the Office of Minority Health that was established at uh, HHS headquarters. And from there, there were also additional um, programs that were established because of her efforts. Well, in 1990, we also had the uh, second African-American Health uh, and Human Services Secretary, Dr. Lewis Sullivan. And Dr. Sullivan was one of those external champions that had pushed Margaret Heckler during the Reagan administration. So Sullivan, actually when they were creating the Healthy People 2000 agenda, says, you know what, I'm going to actually be bold and include as one of the priorities reducing health disparities. Had never been done before. He got a lot of backlash from folks internally, as you can imagine, but he still pushed ahead and said, nope, this is an issue worth considering, and we're going to uh, actually include it in the agenda. Well, around that same time, Sullivan worked with Congressman Stokes, and you might have seen his name, Louis Stokes' his name, on one of the buildings here at NIH. He was the first African American to get, get a seat on the powerful Appropriations Committee, and from there, he pushed the agenda. And he had worked several years now after Margaret Heckler had convened the task force and they had established the Office of Minority Health. He was extremely concerned that the Office of Minority Health could just be um, eliminated through executive order. And so he and other folks in the Tricaucus, do any of you know what I mean when I say the Tricaucus? Have you heard that term before? No? Okay, so the Tricaucus really are the three racial and ethnic caucuses in the um, House and Senate. So you're looking at the uh, Congressional Black Caucus, the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, and the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. And sometimes it includes the Native American Caucus. So these groups really pushed um, together and said, you know what, let's create a pretty comprehensive legislation around this issue. We've got to codify the Office of Minority Health. We've got to co codify the Office of Minority um, Health here at NIH, et cetera. And that's what they did through the Disadvantaged Minority Health Improvement Act of 1990. That was huge. It was huge because it had taken 100 years to get this type of legislation passed. So post-Reconstruction, there was one, only one law that was ever passed that helped the newly freed slaves. That was the Freedmen's Bureau that actually said we're going to provide some level of medical care to these newly freed individuals, as well as refugees, so those who had fought in the Civil War. 
And interestingly enough, in order to pass that law, they also, they could not show preference to one racial group versus another. That was the same tactic that they used post-Reconstruction in the 1860s. They used again in 1990 to pass this bill. So very, very interesting um, stuff. And we can go into more if you're interested. At that point, the Tricaucus realized, along with Senate champions, Senator Kennedy and others, that, wait a second, that bill, the Disadvantaged Minority Health um, Improvement Act, was really small. It didn't quite get to it. Yes, it appropriated some funds to research these uh, issues, but we needed to do more. We needed to establish centers of excellence through the NIH at various universities to really study this in a comprehensive manner. And that was the law that passed by the Clinton administration in 2000, the Minority Health and Health Disparities Research and Education Act. And many of you in health disparities, if you recall, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality publishes an annual health disparities report. You guys know about that? Yes? Yeah? Okay. So that is a result of this law. The Institute of Medicine's Unequal Treatment Report, that landmark report around healthcare disparities, was also authorized by Congress in that act. So just a little heads up. And then you see the reports that have come out as a result of that law. Interestingly enough, you remember it was a report that external stakeholders produced, gave to the Secretary in 1983 that really pushed this agenda. And from there, it created legislation, or legislation was created to address disparities. Well, that legislation then authorized additional reports, which then continued to push this health equity agenda forward in um, public policy. So you get a sense of how that worked. Now, moving beyond the Bush administration's um, 2000 Healthy People agenda, the Healthy People 2010 agenda actually, for the first time, decided to go even more, to be even more bold and say, we're going to move away from reducing disparities to now eliminating disparities. That was huge. And Dr. Satcher, who was the 16th U.S. Surgeon General at the time, worked with uh, President Clinton to come up with this race, um, racial and ethnic health disparities initiative. And there they pushed that agenda in the healthy people agenda. And so that's why you see eliminating health disparities is now one of the key goals. But now the Obama administration said, we're going to actually beat that. We're going to go beyond that and say, not only should you eliminate health disparities, but you should achieve health equity and improve the health of all groups, regardless of status. And that's where we are today with the Healthy People 2020 agenda. So if you're like me and you need to see the overall uh, rainforest before we get down into the trees, I thought this might be helpful, putting everything together. Interestingly enough, the blue line represents legislation that has been introduced over the last 32 years. And you'll see the three major legislation uh, that were produced, actually 10 years apart, which is very interesting to me. Um, notice the increase and the impact that it has had with these reports now that the first legislation produced and how that increased the number of uh, legislation that were actually introduced. I thought it was pretty interesting. Um, I hope you do too. Let's move on. So the result of all of this in 2010 was the Affordable Care Act. Very contentious, as many of you know, um, but it really is the most comprehensive law ever passed by Congress that directly addresses health disparities. In fact, in this law are 62 provisions that directly address this issue, and they're found throughout the entire law in various titles of this act from the health insurance reforms with expanded coverage to the data collection and reporting um, provisions to prevention and wellness, public health provisions, the comparative effectiveness research. So the research section has some very robust um, health equity requirements. The delivery system, payment system reforms also address that. And we'll talk about national strategies that were included in there and workforce development. How do we go about, since many of you are interested in public health and medicine, what the law now requires is that um, you actually become culturally competent providers. You not only are, what does patient-centered care mean? It means that you're culturally competent, you understand the communities in which you're serving. And you remember the story that I told earlier, that really is what we're trying to get at, folks who understand the culture. All right, and then of course an attack on fraud and abuse. So overall, we know that it's going to be transforming the delivery of care from uh, treating sickness to actually preventing um, illness and promoting wellness in the first place. It actually pro it strengthens protections. 
before, there were, of course, some civil rights laws on the books, but it never prevented discrimination against folks with pre-existing conditions. And you often heard um, women were often charged twice as much as a male um, because of her reproductive status. That's no longer allowed because they strengthened those um, anti-discrimination laws. Then, of course, again, through successive laws, we've been able to prioritize uh, the reduction of health disparities, um, and, and have the research really focus on this issue, dedicating tremendous resources to this issue, and you'll see that as we move forward. Then we're going to ensure that we have a more robust data and um, data reporting and collection system. Um, now, because of the law, every single federal and public health um, activity, program, or survey needs to collect racial and ethnic demographic data, and it also includes um, primary language, disability status, and sex. And then, of course, you see the rest there. There are numerous grant opportunities, and then um, there are provisions in there around expansion of coverage. Uh, I took out the 32 million, as you saw, that strike, uh, it struck through intentionally, and that's because of the Supreme Court decision, and we'll talk about that as well. So let's dig down just a little bit deeper into this law, and let's talk about what are some of these health equity-related provisions we're talking about. So what this law did was to elevate health equity in the federal agencies. And you might recall that, and how many of you are familiar with the National Institute on, Mi on Minority Health and Health Disparities? Everybody? Good. So that was a center before it was an institute. This law actually elevated it. And um, what we recognized was that, or what many of us health equity champions uh, felt, was that it was treated as a secondary um, center. It wasn't given the clout that it deserved. We believed that the time was ripe to elevate it to an institute, and that happened. In addition to that, we also wanted to see the Office of Minority Health at the um, uh, Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. We wanted to see that elevated to the Office of the Secretary. We wanted to make sure that minority health was considered, that health disparity elimination was considered every single time they are discussing policy. And so that office was elevated to the office of the secretary. And it, in addition to that, we wanted to make sure that the independent agencies like um, HRQ, the FDA, CMS, uh, SAMHSA, et cetera, that they had offices of behavioral health equity or minority health. So they internally could continue to make sure that folks were paying attention to these issues, thinking about how any programs, any policies that they were developing could impact vulnerable populations. Now, moving on to the insurance um, uh, title of the law. What's fascinating about this are the navigators. So you, may, maybe some of you have been serving as navigators where you're going out trying to get folks enrolled in these health insurance marketplaces. Well, we wanted to make sure that these navigators were actually reaching communities that um, I don't think HHS has successfully reached in the past. And so they, we wanted a requirement in there that these navigators actually understood Various uh, communities, they actually understood the culture. They knew how to get them on. We know in the Latino population, a lot of them were concerned about signing up. We needed folks who understood why that was the case and could reach out to them and convince them to get health insurance coverage. So Navigators was one success. Then we wanted to also provide an incentive um, payment system in the health insurance marketplace where if a provider creates a program looking at the underlying disparities in their communities. If they develop that program, we believe that they should get an extra incentive payment on top of their Medicare or Medicaid reimbursement. So we put that in there as well, and we're watching how that develops at the, on the um, state level. Then there's the data collection. We talked about that piece. We talked about non-discrimination. Um, very, very um, big deal there. Here with the quality provisions, again, we wanted folks to recognize that we saw a lot of disparities still occurring from 2002 when the IOM um, report on equal treatment came out. We were concerned that CMS was not adequately addressing the intersection of quality improvement and health disparities. Oftentimes what was happening, we believe, is that as they do these delivery system reforms, they, it actually results in increasing disparities among uh, racial and ethnic minority groups or other uh, vulnerable populations. And so we put that in there front and center. We wanted patient-centered health, com health homes or uh, PCMHs to actually build in a system 
for all of their providers where they had to tackle this issue of health disparities in their communities. And so you will see they also get reimbursed based on how well they meet that requirement. Then the community health teams. These are teams of you know, community health workers and others who, would work, who will work with the primary care physician to make sure that they are addressing needs, that they understand the community, uh, sort of helping the physician become more engaged with the community. And we were successful there. The shared decision-making, this is what I call the robust informed consent model. And we wanted folks to really think about when you're putting together, as you're explaining the um, treatment or you're explaining what, um, what issues might concern your particular patient, we wanted to make sure that um, they had a template from which they could use. And so there have been grants that have gone out. Uh, Johns Hopkins University of Maryland and others around here have gotten some of that funding to develop these SDM models to help physicians, to help uh, dentists, uh, psychologists, and others uh, think about how they present information to a patient. Then there's a quality measure development. As folks go into this um, quality measurement uh, system, we wanted to make sure that they were looking and disaggregating it by race and ethnicity, and I think that's going um, smoothly so far. And then there's a CER. So how many of you know about the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI? Have you been involved in that? A few? Okay. So PCORI actually was established now to look at how a particular drug or a medical device might impact various population groups, right? And one of the four or one of the five uh, key priorities is that they have to address health disparities. They have to look at the disparities among various population groups and um, produce reports that could be helpful to physicians and other groups, hospitals, et cetera. Workforce development, again, for the first time ever, we have some extremely robust uh, provisions in there that re require medical schools, nursing schools, um, school departments of psychology, et cetera, to come up with curriculum around cultural competency. And you will see that when many of you go to medical school or nursing school or psychology uh, programs, you will see that um, many of them are emphasizing that because they are now required to. And um, I think we are pleased with how things are moving there. Um, in addition to that, there is the National Healthcare Workforce Commission. This is probably one of the sad, um, sad provisions because it has not been implemented yet. Unfortunately, because of politics and how things have worked, it has received no funding. These were one of those provisions that received, uh, it had to go through the appropriations process to get funded. The commissioners have been named, but it still cannot uh, carry out its duties, which is to look at disparities. So they're supposed to convene this group. They're supposed to look at geographic disparities, look at where there might be disparities in frontier, rural, and urban areas, and then make recommendations to Congress uh, in terms of devoting more appropriations, et cetera. So uh, that's one that we're still working on, and we're hopeful that eventually it will get funded. And then, of course, the National Health Service Corps. Big, big deal for the Obama administration. And uh, they continue to invest uh, hundreds of millions of dollars trying to get folks to go to these underserved communities. So very interesting stuff. Now, I'm going to close this section with a prevention fund. How many of you remember this issue? I mean, how many of you know about the prevention fund? Remember hearing? How many of you watch late night comedy? Am I the only one? Okay, three of you? Okay. So Jay Leno, during the health reform negotiations, actually didn't hurt, actually didn't help our cause. He hurt us because he was making fun of the fact that Congress had put in this $15 billion fund to build jungle gyms and parks. I mean, ridiculous. He was oversimplifying it. What we were using this money for is to actually build the public health workforce. We wanted to use these funds to look at the most pressing chronic diseases in communities across the nation. And we wanted to use some of these funds to actually look at how we could address some of the underlying disparities as they develop these programs. Well, it has constantly been under attack by opponents of health reform. And um, we can go into a little more how that's happened. I'll show you shortly. But in addition to all those provisions, there were s uh, several strategies that we were able to get both Congress and the administration to include in this comprehensive bill. The National Health Disparity Strategy, it's really called the Action Plan to Eliminate Health Disparities, and it's a, it has a compendium, the National Stakeholder Strategy. We wanted HHS to provide some guidance about how they were going to actually go about addressing this specifically. And then we wanted them to produce a report that stakeholders across the United States, so 
if you are a municipality or if you're in state government, we wanted them to have a model by which they could use for their respective municipality or state. That's why that was developed. In addition, the national quality strategy. We wanted folks that aren't necessarily health equity champions. They don't really care about health disparities. We wanted to force them to take a look at this issue, to understand that when the Institute of Medicine says that equity is a key component of quality, crossing the quality chasm report, many of you might recall that one, we wanted them to actually take a look, or a second look, or even a third look, and say, wait a second, the the HHS folks are actually going in this direction. They want us, if we're going to apply for a grant, we've got to show how we're going to demonstrate success here. So that's why the NQS was established. The National Prevention Strategy was led by the Surgeon General. Um, at the time, the 18th Surgeon General, Regina Benjamin, she made sure that when they are talking about public health issues, that disparities was a key component of that as well. The National Health Liter Literacy Strategy also has some pretty robust health equity provisions, and the federal HIT strategy has some pretty robust um, health disparities provisions, as well as the national HIV and AIDS strategy. So these really are the first ever strategies by the, US, by the federal government that directly target this issue. Now, one of my favorite issues is talking about money. It's the one thing that keeps me up at night, and it's actually, I try to go away from this. I actually went to law school because I didn't want to have to deal with numbers, but my God, if you have no money, you can't carry out your mission, right? And so what I wanted to show you, and I'm hoping I do a good job, you can tell me, is to show you how some of these programs either fall under mandatory funding, which means that they bypass the Appropriations Committee and they're just automatically funded, or they have to go, they're discretionary um, funded programs, and they have to go through that appropriations process, which you know uh, the folks who actually um, govern right now are very opposed to a lot of these programs, and so they would absolutely not fund it. But you get a sense of what has taken place from community health centers, um, funding those and funding the building of new community health centers to the National Health Service Corps, building communities or school-based health centers. The maternal, infant, and early childhood home visiting programs also got mandatory funding. But take a look, and you'll realize that most of their funding has either expired or is about to expire come October, so the fiscal year 15. Uh, very, very interesting, and it's a challenge that all of us health equity champions are dealing with right now. Um, in addition to that, you see the Community Prevention and Public Health Fund that we just talked about. You'll see strikethroughs because over th there have been three instances in which opponents of the health reform law have been successful in attacking this one provision. One was to say you couldn't use these, um, the, the funding under the prevent prevention fund for propaganda purposes, which, quite frankly, nobody was using it for that. But then they reduced the funding, and then they reduced it again. And now we have, um, of the $15 billion that we were supposed to enjoy, it's cut by $6.25 billion, so way less than we thought we would have to work with. Um, interestingly enough, a lot of the discretionary programs, many of these programs, were getting funds through the prevention fund. This is why it was absolutely critical for all of us health equity champions to protect this funding stream because we recognize that the only way that the administration would be able to actually fund a lot of these programs was through the prevention fund, which is why we're a little concerned moving forward. And you get a sense of how that's happened, some of these other programs and, um, and the requirements there. Moving forward, the other part of the funding stream uh, funding issues that concern us. When we look at the president's fiscal year 2013, 14, 15, and 16 budgets, it's been extremely interesting to see that a lot of the Title VII programs, do, do you guys know what Title VII is? These are the workforce um, programs, so medicine, nursing, Title VIII is nursing, et cetera. But it's, you know, the workforce uh, provisions of the Public Health Services Act. And what the administration is trying to do is to slate all of these programs that were created right after their pipeline programs that were created right after the civil rights movement and um, slate them for termination. They say they're no longer necessary. What we need to focus on is using these resources to inc increase the primary care workforce. We're pushing back and saying absolutely not. We need these pipeline programs to expose more individuals to the um, health professions. In addition to that, we have also seen how deficit reduction has tempered our um, ability to continue pushing the agenda. We saw huge losses over the last two fiscal years. 
Um, we know that we're on a hiatus right now, thank God. But um, if Congress does not resolve this issue, where they do arbitrary cuts to all of the discretionary programs, many of our health equity programs will continue to see drastic reductions in funding. That's extremely scary. And then coming up in March and in April, you're going to see the debt ceiling issue come up again. And you're going to see Congress and the administration going at it back and forth. It's going to be extremely contentious, um, like it has, I'm sure, in previous Congresses. And what always happens as a result is a modification or repeal of critical provisions in the Affordable Care Act. And this is just a short list of many of the provisions in that law that have been uh, terminated. So you get an idea um, what's happened. And then let me draw your attention to the Prevention of Public Health Fund. You see that the last time that they messed with this fund was to say that we're actually now not going to allow the Obama administration to use these funds, um, using their terms as a slush fund, but they're going to allocate which programs now get funding from this fund. Very interesting, and we had to push and make sure that some of the programs that we care about, the National REACH program, et cetera, that those got funding underneath there. So it's, it's been quite a, quite a journey. So you heard me say no money, no mission. These are the implications. We're going to continue to see um, debt ceiling, deficit reduction, sequestration um, impacting these programs. We know that there has been an effort by opponents of health reform to turn a lot of the mandatory appropriated programs to discretionary appropriated programs. Uh, we'll continue to see that. And then ACA funding for quality improvement, we have noticed that during regulations, they have not, or during an RFP, they have not been prioritizing health disparities reduction, and we're going to continue to push uh, back on folks at CMS there. So just an idea of things to come. So let's talk about the Supreme Court. And I like Jonathan Turley, Professor Turley's uh, comment about, in the end, it can be viewed as a success only to the extent a crash landing is still considered a landing. And it really, this ruling, as well as the last one in June, is anything but final, and we'll see why. I wanted to bring your attention. We know about the individual mandate. I won't belabor that point. But in terms of Medicaid expansion, this was extremely interesting because every single constitutional law scholar from Georgetown to George Washington to Howard on down uh, to the uh, West Coast, every single one agreed that the Supreme Court wasn't going to touch Medicaid expansion. And in fact, every single appellate court, every single court of appeals, didn't even touch this issue. So imagine our shock when the um, decision came out, and the Supreme Court says, actually, you have violated the Constitution by threatening states with the loss of their existing Medicaid funding. So what they said was that it was unduly coercive. They said that it transformed the Medicaid program so drastically, so we're talking about Medicaid expansion, that it was a shift in kind, not degree. And then they employed what I thought was interesting, this contractual legal argument that the states, when they first established Medicaid, could have, could have um, they, they could not have had any adequate notice that Congress would have come back in and done such a thing, which I thought was actually erroneous legal reasoning, but again, and so did all of these constitutional law scholars, but it was extremely eye-opening. And what I like about the Supreme Court, though, and, and this decision was that they gave both sides a little something. So both sides could actually wave the banner and say, oh my God, our side won. Very, very... Um, Smart, I thought. A smart move on their part. So what was the impact of this decision now on Medicaid expansion across the United States? You get the sense here the green states are those that went ahead and expanded Medicaid. What's interesting about this map is that from the time when the, the, in the 1960s when Medicaid was actually first established or when states had the opportunity to establish their Medicaid programs, um, this map is actually following that similar trend. So it's not surprising where you have some holdout states still, the majority of them in the, in the Deep South. It's the same exact trend that was happening in the 1960s. Um, and so we are hopeful, although I have to say we had a great disappointment with Tennessee and Wyoming. Uh, many of you might have heard about the Koch brothers, and there was a, um, a, an article in Modern Healthcare and in the Washington Post that talked about this new strategy from the Koch brothers where they, and they were extremely successful in Tennessee. I'll tell you, the hospital association, the community health centers, all of the providers, the docs there, who were very much for expanding Medicaid were extremely shocked because this um, 
new campaign by the, by the two brothers actually was successful in, in, in delaying or actually preventing uh, the expansion of Medicaid in their states, at least for the foreseeable future. Um, we will continue to see they have promised to continue to do so with Utah and Indiana, and then we are extremely nervous then with all these other states that are not participating currently. But there might be, a, you know, maybe half a legislature or maybe the governor might be interested in expanding. We wanted to develop strategies to convince them it was the right thing to do. It's going to make our jobs that much harder. So in addition to the legal challenges that we just talked about, we know that um, right now the challenge to the individual mandate, the Obama administration won that case. The challenge is to contraceptive coverage. They lost that case, and the Supreme Court actually sided with closely held um, corporations. There is, there is actually another case coming up with um, dealing with religious liberty, and um, the Catholic Health Initiatives and others have been pushing. So we'll see those on the nonprofit side coming up uh, to the Supreme Court. The premium tax credits, we know we're going to hear oral arguments in March. This is going to be absolutely key because if the court decides against the administration on this issue, it really will gut a significant piece of the Affordable Care Act. And then you get a sense of the other issues that are winding their way uh, through the courts. The silver lining in all of this is that the states that have been restricting navigators' ability to go out and enroll uh, folks into the health insurance marketplaces, the Missouri District Court and another court, federal court, said no states, you can't prevent the navigators from doing this. That violates the law. So what I thought I would do was to show just how um, opponents of health reform are really thinking about this in terms of delaying or preventing access to affordable health insurance coverage, right? We know that the mandate was one um, leg that they were going after. They were not successful. The other piece is going after the subsidies because if you don't have the subsidies, which 87% of the people who are currently enrolled in the exchanges um, receive, that would wipe out the affordability factor for them. And then the pre-existing um, exclusion, uh, pre-existing condition exclusion, um, the anti-discrimination provision, then would actually keep things extremely costly. So opponents of health reform know that if they can knock out that leg, they would have success, been successful in undermining a key component of the Affordable Care Act. So thought I would share that with you. Now, in terms of how this is working, you get a sense of the states that um, the red states are actually the ones that have defaulted to the federal government to run their health insurance exchange. The yellow ones, they've done it in partnership with the feds. And the green are those that um, actually have their own state-based health insurance exchange. Well, you might recall the arguments that are coming up actually center on this issue. So they're saying that because, and, and some are saying because of sloppy legislative writing, that um, only if you are a state-based health insurance exchange um, should you be able to get subsidies for the residents in your states. That those residents that live in states that have deferred to the federal government, they should not be entitled to any of the, any of the subsidies. And as you can imagine, oh my gosh, what an impact that's going to have. All of these red states, any one with families in these areas or friends that have been getting subsidies, all of that would be wiped out. So what I wanted to do was let's look at the future now. Let's look at the trend, what's going on in terms of this issue of minority health and health disparities. You saw that trend where legislation um, was increasing around this issue or health disparities. But as soon as the Affordable Care Act passed, we saw a significant decline now um, in the, the uh, last two Congresses. That was extremely eye-opening for us. And part of it is due to the fact that proponents have really been focusing on implementing this law, and a lot of them are burned out. Same thing we see with minority health bills, the same trend. And not surprising, because that's what happened after President Clinton. When the Clinton administration tried to do health reform, we saw an increase in bills around this issue, but then a significant decline as well. But we're trying to stop that. So what does this all mean? What are we going to do about it? So a group of us came together and created this Health Equity Leadership and Exchange Network, HELEN for short. Um, it's really a collaborative effort. It has uh, health equity champions, um, thought leaders uh, in 45 of the 50 states and in um, half of the U.S. territories. And um, what we're trying to do is to get folks not only in government, so you have the state and public health, the health departments or public health departments uh, coming together as well as the feds. But we wanted to bring, you know, students, academics, um, public health professionals, um, medical professionals, nurses, 
all of these folks, lawyers, policy um, wonks, together to say, let's think about how we can move and push this issue in a meaningful manner. Here are all the things that are occurring right now. How can we make sure that we sustain this campaign or reignite it or get folks that weren't engaged to begin with? And so we established this with generous funding from the Aetna Foundation, um, NIH, um, CMS, et cetera. And just to give you an idea of what this Helen Initiative, it's an online portal. And what we realize is every time we go, so Brian Smedley, any of you know who Brian is? Brian Smedley was the author of the Institute of Medicine's report, um, incredible guru on this issue. And together what we realize is that as we were going from state to state, we recognized, gee, I didn't know that there was a person here, a health equity champion in Arizona that cared deeply about this issue. Or they would raise issues um, that were similar to what folks in Texas or Minnesota um, might have uh, been confronted with. And so we decided, gee, we've got to get folks together. We've got to strengthen the leadership around this issue. And we need to get information um, in as close to real time out to health equity champions. We need to actually start sharing strategies and breaking down silos. And that's what this is about. It has an interactive map of the United States. You click on it. You can find health equity champions in that state who you might be able to reach out to. Um, if you are in Texas, for instance, they, were, they had a very interesting um, issue where their Office of Minority Health was repealed by legislation. And then uh, the folks there, the health equity champions, were successful in getting that very um, same legislation legislature to say, wait a second, we need you to authorize this task force, which essentially does the same thing. But then it was repealed again, and they were successful again in getting a commission that's looking at this very issue. How did you go about doing that? The folks in Philadelphia would like to know, in, in Pennsylvania. So it's really getting folks to start, start sharing that information. We know that the NIH has um, been funding all of these universities to look at health disparities. They are centers of excellence, like I said. What's happening to that research? What is so innovative about your research that might be helpful to folks in other states? We've got to start collaborating. We've got to start sharing that because if we are going to convince our policymakers to continue to prioritize this issue, they've got to see a return on investment. And that's what we're pushing all of these researchers, all of these um, academics, these policymakers, et cetera, at the state and local level to make sure that they're coming together in a meaningful way around this issue. And so some of the objectives here you heard me talk about, um, where we are monitoring, we're informing and monitoring the development, implementation, and promotion of various laws and policies and programs at various levels. We're researching, analyzing, and disseminating objective, nonpartisan information. So we welcome everyone, regardless of political affiliation, to join. And, um, and it's been very interesting because we've had folks who you might not necessarily think would be interested in this issue in Georgia. We've had folks that folks dismissed and said, oh, they're not going to care about this issue of health disparities. But when you are a state that prides yourself on being the number one state for doing business, well, you want a healthy population. You want to be able to show these stats to these um, potential employers so they come into your state. So we've been working with a group of folks that um, some had dismissed, and we are showing some, I think, some pretty good results uh, so far. And then other key features you see over there, the online forum, the interactive map, um, key features in the library. Uh, we wanted to make sure that folks had a one-stop shop to go and get information. There you can get fact sheets, um, analyses, matrices, charts, FAQs, etc. on every single law that has been enacted by the states. And then, of course, any policies that have been proposed, we're now working on that piece. So you get, uh, get that information. And you can understand where the trends are uh, in various states. And the reason why we're, we're really focusing on the state level is because last year, in the last Congress, only 300 and about 25 bills passed into law. But at the state level, with all of these state legislatures, over 45,000 bills were enacted into law. And so we know that the states are great incubators for what we're trying to do at the federal level. We continue to push that agenda. So I thought I would close with one of my heroes, Justice Thurgood Marshall, where he says the legal system can force open doors and sometimes even knock down walls, but it cannot build bridges. That job belongs to you and me. Thank you, guys. So I guess I'll entertain questions now.